I make a lot of videos, specifically software-focused educational videos. Whether it's the daily videos on this channel or full produced workshops for sites like Rust Adventure, a lot of thought has gone into how I present those videos and what tools I use to do so. In many of my videos, I get asked various questions. What font is that? What theme is that? What program are you using for window management? Today, I'm gonna to share with you the setup that I use and the settings that I use for a few of my daily use desktop programs. But I do feel like it's important to contextualize this. My setup is geared towards a few use cases. The first one will be enabling the person watching a YouTube video on their phone before bed at night, or say on the counter while cooking. A second use case I prioritize is desktop users watching on half or less of their screen while coding along to a video. You'll see these two use cases most prominently reflected in the size of the fonts, the size of my UI that I use, and the number of windows that I am able to fit on a screen. Thirdly, I try to reduce the mental load for viewers who are already loaded up when trying to learn something else. So if we're talking about shaders or we're talking about Rust or some JavaScript thing or some new language comes along and we're talking about that, it's already hard enough, in my opinion, to learn something new that you're unfamiliar with. You shouldn't also have to dig through what's on screen to figure out what you should pay attention to. And you shouldn't have things that are flashing on screen as typing is happening, let's say, that pull your visual attention to places where it isn't needed. So with that, let's take a look at the default VS Code installation. Now, this isn't quite the standard default VS Code installation. This is just most of the things re-enabled from my minimal setup. So for example, you'll see that I have things like Rust Analyzer or my uh, VS Code color theme, Night Owl, all enabled. And of course, these things don't come with VS Code by default. I just wanna point out how much stuff there is on screen right now. On the left-hand side, we've got a number of different um, items in this toolbar. On the bottom, we've got a number of different status, I guess, is what we would call these, or I think this is called the activity bar in VS Code parlance. But this allows you to select language mode. It's telling me that Prettier isn't on, which is weird because this is a Rust project with a cargo toml, and Prettier doesn't even cover Rust as a syntax, as far as I remember. We've got kind of unrelated icons here, like tweet feedback, and tools that I'm just not going to use in the vast majority of my videos, like live share or I'm clicking to connect to AWS. The typing experience in this default install is also very flashy. So as I start to type these strings, you can see that there is quite a few things that come up as I'm typing that are extremely distracting. And I don't know if it'll catch it on the video, but whenever I type here and save, things on the right sort of update and move back and forth and flash. Whereas if I say, do something like this that is clearly an error because we don't have a return type here. Um, the left and right here, whether it's a warning or an error or something like that, um, moves back and forth. It's not stable. So every time I type, um, every time I hover over something, something pops up. Every time I try to start typing anything, there's all of these pop-ups and all of these things that are happening on screen. And the purpose of my setup is to get rid of all of that. So in contrast to what the default VS Code setup looks like, this is my setup on the right. Now there is one thing that I usually take away from my more produced videos that is still here, which is this, I don't know what to call it, this little toolbar here. And because VS Code is just a Electron app or whatnot, you can open the inspect element and you can find this element and you can hide it if you want to. There's also um, VS Code extensions that will do invasive modifications like that but I've chosen to not show those invasive modifications in this video, instead keeping it to things that people can just choose to install or enable themselves without having an adverse effect on their potential experience. So you can already see that moving the sidebar to the right here is a fairly large change that immediately affects the quality of life. So if you see on the right-hand side, I'm opening and closing the sidebar, and the only thing that happens on screen is the file uh, list shows up and goes away. Whereas if we do that on the left, the entire code pane gets shifted left and right, which is pretty disorienting if you're trying to follow something on screen. Again, we've removed the activity bar down here. We've removed the toolbar on the left-hand side. 
The breadcrumbs are also gone. Um, the title in the toolbar on top is also gone as well. We've removed the mini map as well as the sidebar here. So if you have say an error in this program here, you get a little mark in the mini bar as well, but you get a mark on this sidebar and none of that exists here. So we're sacrificing some areas where feedback can exist for sort of the purpose of showing things when we want to show things. So I'll close out the default on the left. I think I've made the point that this is kind of um, meant to be more minimalistic. It means that I can do things like this, blow it up super big and show you like, hey, here's, here's the code that I'm writing. It's only four lines or whatever. And now the code fills up the entire screen. We still get the Rust Analyzer feedback here, but you can see that when I type here, I don't get um, an amazing amount of pop-ups. So let me keep my audio going while I type this out and we'll see that absolutely zero pop-ups have popped up there, except that little light bulb on the side, if you caught that. Let's turn off the Rust Analyzer inlay hints and I'll save the file and now we have T and now we can do T dot. And you'll see that the um, pop-up window for autocomplete here takes about five seconds to pop up if it pops up at all. And it usually doesn't because I have most everything turned off. And then the only pop-ups that I get are the actual functions for which the autocomplete is going to work. So on this, we have a string. So we have gotten as bytes on string and therefore we have that. That's that. And then if we actually do have errors, we do get to see the little squiggles. The file name still turns red. So there is definitely a problem. Um, and there are definitely still UI elements that are put in here through Rust Analyzer and stuff like that. So I could hit run here and it could try to run, which will fail because the program doesn't run right now because there's an error in it. Um, so we'll just get rid of that. Another useful thing to know is that I don't actually use the built-in terminal inside of VS Code. And this is to achieve this window layout that we'll talk a little bit about later. So I usually use Chrome if I need to use a browser, but this is Arc. And Arc, as you can see, has a very minimal style by default. So I have to hover over to see the toolbar or on the left-hand side, I have to uh, command S to get the sidebar to come out. There's not a lot of uh, Chrome, <laughs> for lack of a better word here. If you look side by side with actual Chrome, you can see, um, if I get these to approximately the same size, you can see how much more visual noise there is. There's the whole top bar with the tabs. There's the URL bar and any extensions that might be here, whether I'm signed in or not, because Google signs me out all the time, et cetera, et cetera, right? All, a bunch of things that don't need to be there that take up space that make it harder for me to show what I'm trying to show. So these days I do prefer Arc even though Chrome is still, I don't want to say more stable, but it's more of a um, continuous element when I'm testing. So let's start going through some stuff specifically. Night Owl is my theme. Night Owl is wonderful. It's available for basically anything you could possibly want at this point. It's made by the wonderful Sarah Drasner. Highly suggest you follow them on Twitter or wherever you follow people. Wonderful person, very knowledgeable. Built this wonderful theme. And of course, you can see this theme both in VS Code on the left and in iTerm2 on the right. Um, it's I use it everywhere. I use it even on my blog, for example. So I won't go over every setting individually. I'll leave a link in the description to this file so you can pull out whatever you want out of it. But I will say that basically any option that removes some UI that isn't critical, and I have a very high bar for what critical means in my usage, something is critical if it's like the file name or it's the code that we're looking at, or it is direct feedback that is unobtrusive from something like Rust Analyzer. So you can see that I've basically pulled everything down into the file name. We do have some additional information here, like whether the file was modified or not. But usually when I'm talking about things and when I am writing code myself, I'm always conscious of which file I'm in anyway. And I make that very clear. I basically say, go into source main.rs and type this in this place, right? So it doesn't really help me to have a bunch of different places. It doesn't help me to have the full file path all the way through to like from my home directory or my user directory all the way through to like whatever directory we happen to be working in. So the approach here is very much rely on keyboard shortcuts more often than not. When you use keyboard shortcuts and things like that, especially in VS Code, it pops up this nice menu, which people can see me typing in. So 
I try to most of the time use this menu unless the command I'm running doesn't matter. So for example, I have a hotkey for turning Rust Analyzer type inlays on and off. I don't want them on all the time because people tend to think they are actually code that they need to write. So I have control RI bound to turning those on and off. I have things like format on save on. So if I add too many spaces here, I can hit save and then it will automatically cargo format my entire project. I find that things like this are really useful, especially when I'm talking about code in multiple places at multiple times because it keeps all of the code consistent. Whereas me tracking every little space around this entire file um, is untenable in general. So format on save, turn all UI off. So breadcrumbs off, render line, highlight, gutter, cursor style, underline, thin. Uh, there is other options here. My font, my preferred font is Meslo LGLDZ for power line, which is Oh, a mouthful. But basically, it is a Menlo derivative with different settings for spacings and then the option to have a dotted zero or not. So you can see at 5,000 here, it's very clear whether this is a zero or it is an O, like a capital O. So differentiating those two things across all of the videos for people who are watching is really important to me. And then for Powerline, because I used to use Powerline a long time ago, and these days I use other things that expect my fonts to have like programmer icons in them, uh, that's where the Powerline stuff comes from. It's basically like stuff injected into this font that's been created so that I can show different icons and things like that. I turn the minimap off. I turn the word-based suggestions off. I blow out the quick suggestions delay to far longer than I ever sit in one spot. Um, this is five seconds. I turn the hover, like and when you hover over something and it pops up another window, I turn those off. I turn off all the quick suggestions. I turn off all of the parameter hints. I turn off the overrule or border. I turn off the vertical scroll baller size, which you actually can't turn off. So you have to just set to zero and so on and so forth. I set the window title to an empty space. I set the horizontal and vertical scroll bars to nothing. I set the sidebar uh, location to the right, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So basically turn off all of the UI you can possibly turn off because most of it is not helping. There's a couple things that I miss. For example, like this little icon on the left-hand side here, this little whatever this is. I have no idea what that is, but I would like to turn it off. <laughs> so you get the status bar and the activity bar and stuff like that. You can also turn off. These are all Boolean values. So it's just find them all set them all to false, and then they're off forever. So if you ever need to pull things up, it's like command B to pull out the file menu. Or if you want to go to the console, you can go in and type console or something like that. You can see debug console, focus on debug, and it'll open that window for you if you ever need it to be there. That does require that you like know that these things exist. So take it or leave it, but I really like that. Um, this is one of the things that I was talking about earlier. I'm trying a new way of getting rid of these icons, which is why they're not gone. Um, I think I updated VS code and something broke. That's why I didn't go over this part. What I do have here is usually some custom CSS that basically gets injected into VS code that allows me to modify whether this shows up or not. I do have show methods in the suggestion pop-ups to on. I feel like the methods are something that I use very often that I rely on. So when I'm typing some Rust code or something like that inside of main.rs, for example, if I wanted to type this as bytes, Rust Analyzer knows this is a string slice. So when I hit dot, it shows me all of the functions that I can actually call, which makes this list of functions very high signal. And also it gives me access to all of the things that I can do that Rust Analyzer just lets me do. Like if I wanted to wrap this T in a match expression, I could hit that and it would expand out for me. So this singular pop-up is extremely valuable. When it pops up, it's showing me something that I can action every single time it pops up. That's why I let it pop up. And then I tried the sticky scroll stuff for a little while. I found out that it was not, it didn't meet my bar for critical information. So I turned it back off, but that's my VS code setup. Like I said, the TLDR is like zoom in a ton, <laughs> turn off all of the UI that is not actually critical to showing or reading some code and use Night Owl because it's awesome. 
Now there are other editors that I do test on a fairly regular basis. So for example, here's the Z editor. Now, one of the problems that I have with the Z editor is that the sidebar doesn't get bigger and I can't figure out how to do that. So for example, I can make all the code bigger and stuff like that, but I can't control the rest of the UI as well, which makes it kind of a non-starter for making videos because this like main.rs or like whatever this is called when it's faded back and uh, is the tar actually the target folder. I'll just tell you what it is, but you can't read that if you're just like on a screen, right? So, or like the dot git up here or something like that. So while I really like Zed, I think it's headed in a really interesting direction, much like some other editors, right? I think I really like experimenting with new things. And actually my favorite editor is not VS Code, it's Emacs. So today you learned, I guess, but I use VS Code because the videos take priority for me and the ability to communicate with other people takes priority over my own uh, preferences. So that's VS Code. Probably the next most interesting thing is this table and my terminal in general. So they're kind of combined. Um, the terminal I use is either Alacrity. So this on the left is Alacrity, um, which is nice, but I was having some issues with recordings. So I switched back to iTerm and iTerm is fine as well. <laughs> so I don't know. I switch back and forth between them. I use iTerm 2 these days, mostly if I'm on a Mac. I use Alacrity if I'm on a kick to use Alacrity or Alacrity. It might be Alacrity. Um, both very fine terminal emulators, iTerm being um, significantly more sort of powerful or, oop, I didn't mean to open that. Open profiles, edit profiles. Okay, so iTerm has an absolute ton of different kinds of settings and things like that. Okay, so what we can do here with um, iTerm 2, it lets you set up basically general appearances. So I'm using a minimal theme, um, et cetera, et cetera. Auto hide menu bar, things like that. Same general like approach to doing this as I have in VS Code. Hide anything that isn't critical. Um, iTerm 2 has an absolute ton of features. I don't use them all. I will say that, of course, my theme is Night Owl. You have themes here. You can download these from the internet. The font, of course, is Meslo LG LDZ for Powerline, which I went over before. The window has no title bar under the style and things like that. So we end up with this very minimal, very like unobtrusive iTerm window, which brings us to the status line here. I, I'm totally blanking on what this is called. Aha, there are prompts. Okay, so my prompt then is Starship. And Starship is really wonderful. It has a ton of features, but in the same way that I minimize my VS Code and I minimize my iTerm, I also minimize my Starship. So in the vast majority of cases, this is just some TOML file. And if we check out that file as raw, then you can see that basically what I've done is just disabled everything. I don't rely on this for status updates or anything like that. The thing that I use Starship for is mostly controlling the top line here. So this will usually be whatever project I'm working on. In this case, I'm in a temp folder. So I'm in users, Chris TMP, and then default VS code is the name of the folder that I'm in, which means that I can name my project, whatever I want to name it. And that will show at the top of my line. And then it's always nice to have a new line to start typing on rather than typing on the right hand side of you know, the directory structure or whatever. So that's Starship, which brings us to, if Starship is the prompt, then what shell am I running? I'm running new shell, and that's what gives me this wonderful, wonderful table output. It's why I type things with open, and why when I open things, I get tables. So open, pipe, get, let's say, rust. And then it, get, it tells me that uh, it's basically a table with disabled true. So new shell, is absolutely fantastic. I think that a lot of the ways in which bash or bash derivatives, so I used to be a huge user of Z shell, which wonderful, if you love it, go for it. I used to use oh my zish, but I've switched over to new shell entirely at this point. I use it every day, it's wonderful. And the thing that I really like is this way in which you can just interact with data, right? So. In this example, they have an LS, which gives us a table. That table has a bunch of information. So I can do like get name 
and just get the names or I can do like where size is greater than a kilobyte. Nothing's greater than a kilobyte apparently. So let's do less than one kilobyte and that's everything. <laughs> let's do something that actually filters <laughs> greater than 100 bytes. So you see like I can type 100B uh, and I can just type where size is greater than that and it filters the table or the list that I'm looking at or whatever. So that's really what I love about new shell in the first place because a lot of my terminal munging deals with different kinds of data, TOML files, JSON files, making a bunch of fetch requests and then writing that out to a file, stuff like that. And if you are interested in stuff like that, I highly suggest dealing or like taking a look at new shell. It's my favorite shell. I've been using it full time for, I want to say like a year or ish now. I don't know. I would have to think about it, but, um, it is early. It is pre 1.0, but it does also have really advanced stuff. Like you can just create data frames inside of the shell and mess with them, which is absolutely amazing. So new shell is my shell. It's how I get all of the small day-to-day -day, like quality of life stuff like this table. When we do LS, it is also how I do fancier stuff, like write a bunch of scripts so I can open VS code in that directory and We'll just ignore that I have some random notes file hanging out there, but you can see my config.new file, which I will also, I'll link to everything in the description if you want to see any of it. It's mostly the default new shell file with a bunch of custom uh, like aliases and stuff like that that I've written over. The one thing that I do want to point out is this way in which you can define functions. So if I define, like I want to turn a WAV file into a video for some reason, I can write a function that accepts a file and then I can run ffmpeg with that file and a whole bunch of settings. And then I can call that in my terminal now. So in my terminal, I have wave to video and I can just call that on whatever wave file I want. I really like it. Um, it makes a lot more sense in my mind than using bash or something like that. So if you're into that kind of thing, go check it out. I highly suggest it. It's been wonderful for me. And then I think the final thing that I want to check out today or show you today is going to be you buy. So this entire video and all of my videos, I always have this kind of like, if I open a new window, it just pops in. And the thing that powers that on Mac OS for me is you buy. Now you buy is something that I don't actually suggest to people, but it does solve this problem for me in the way that I need it solved, right? So you'll see if you're used to Macs, you'll notice that I've done the same thing with my window layout that I do with everything else. There is no, you know, like application bar sitting around here. There is no title bar um, taking place on top of the screen all the time. I have to go and pull it down. There is no, like, the windows are all not stacked on top of each other. They always have a place and a single space to be on the screen, which means no matter how many windows I have, no matter how many of them I open, I will always have all of them shown on the screen. And what this is called is a binary space partitioning algorithm. And this is a tiling window manager. So there's a bunch of things you can do here. Um, it is scriptable. So I'll have things like you buy M window display, whatever, because I have three displays attached right now. And if I chose one of these, it would send this uh, terminal window to another display, which I'm not going to do because I'm trying to show things. Um, it does for some of the advanced features that I use it for, like disabling window shadows, it does require disabling SIP. So that's why I don't directly suggest it to people, but it does do everything I need it to do. It does binary space partitioning. It does the window shadow removal. It does a whole bunch of other stuff. You can float windows. You can throw windows into the layout. You can add padding to the outside of the window like I have on all of my videos. You can add different padding between windows like I have here. You can even do things like set an active windows border color. So for example, here's the window shadow command that I have um, or the setting that I turn off. So if I open my Yabai RC, um, you can see that I have a couple of things here and then I set the layout to binary space partitioning. I set a bunch of padding. I set the window gap and I set the window shadow to off. And this just guarantees that no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I am, no matter how many windows I have on screen, I have some layout that is displayable and shareable and everything is there on screen, doesn't look messy, um, et cetera. So 
Uh, I highly suggest all of these things. Um, if you are going to use your buy, keep in mind that it does require some of the next level of things that I chose to leave out of this video, some of the more invasive changes. It does work as a layout manager if you don't do those things, but there are uh, you buy features that will not work if you do not disable SIP, such as the window shadow. So I guess finally we can talk a little bit about Arc. I've really been liking Arc lately. It's minimal in the way that I like things to be minimal. It is only available for Mac OS as far as I know. Um, it gives me basically the same thing that I already do. So, I mean, there is a little bit of a double border effect going on. So you've got the border from Yabai and then the border from Arc, um, which I don't really mind that much. It's mostly okay. But the thing that I really like about Arc is that it will close all of these tabs for me if I forget to. So after this video, all of these tabs are going to be gone and then that's just going to be it. And I'm going to wake up in 12 hours. 24 hours or whatever the next time I wake up is and all my tabs will be done. Um, and I start fresh every day, which is a problem I have. <laughs> I don't know if you have same similar problems, but I have screenshots of my desktop with hundreds and hundreds of tabs that are scrunched so small on a 4k screen that you can no longer tell what tab is in the browser. So, I really appreciate a number of different things about Arc, but mostly the tab management and closing my tabs out for me. And also, of course, the minimal aesthetic, which is now very important for all of my stuff. That's a look into some of the tools that I use, a couple of the applications that I use, a couple of the fonts and things like that that I use. I hope it helped. I hope you found that interesting. Uh, I could do another video on like the whole suite of stuff that I use for actually recording and editing and doing things like that. But I figured I would keep this to just programming tools and programs and what's on my desktop at the moment. And these are the things that I use the most in my videos. So I hope you enjoyed it and I will catch you in the next video. Feel free to ask anything else that you're interested in in the comments.